I want to talk about something that came up the other day, and to be honest, I have no idea what the context was anymore of what we were talking about. It had something to do with pagans. I think it might have been something to do with the Olympics and what people, you know, what pagans were doing to blaspheme God and his Passover supper and the extension, the very night that he extended the covenant before he was sacrificed as the lamb, which is, it's detestable and it's disgusting, but these people don't know what they're doing. If only they actually knew what it was that they were doing, I would hope that they would be so ashamed. If they understood, they would be disgusted with themselves. But in any event, I think that was the context. And someone said something about how Christians are supposed to tolerate. Okay, so let's look at that. Are Christians supposed to tolerate? Are we supposed to be tolerant? We're going to take a look at this in scripture. The Bible does not actually use this concept of tolerating. Unfortunately, there are two translations in the NASB, which, you know, so many people say, oh, that's the most accurate or, you know, tout that as being the most accurate translation. So it's pretty disappointing that they would even use this word or this concept given the rest of the context of scripture. So we're going to take a look at this. The two places that it's used in the NASB version is Romans 2.4 and Ephesians 4.2. In Romans 2.4, it says, or do you think in the NASB translation, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? So the question you should be asking yourself is, based on your relationship with God, does he tolerate your sin? Because God doesn't tolerate my sin and he never really has. God has met me where I'm at and disciplined me and set me consequences in order to mold me and teach me and also punish me. God does not tolerate my bad behavior. I mean, if a parent tolerates your bad behavior, a human parent, you would look at that parent, you'd say like, they're not doing their job. Why are you tolerating that bad behavior? Do not misunderstand. God does not tolerate sin. He does not tolerate bad behavior. He sends consequences. He's a good father. I like to cross-reference with the OJB version, the Orthodox Jewish Bible, because there are certain nuances to language, linguistical nuances that we cannot, that don't translate cleanly all the time from one language to another. If anyone speaks Spanish, that's a, that's a perfect example. I mean, I'm sure in every language, there's, there are certain terms and concepts that just don't translate cleanly. And so when I cross-reference with the Orthodox Jewish Bible, I'm able to kind of pick up some of the nuances. So I'm, I'm not going to pronounce these words perfectly so or, or probably well at all, but it doesn't really matter. What we're trying to understand is what is, what, what, what is the feel around this concept that God is trying to use in the Bible? Or do you think lightly of the wealth of his generosity and of his chesed and of his being? Then it says the the Hebrew word, but in parentheses, it says slow of anger, forbearing. And it appears that forbearing really is the concept. It, that, that is probably the best word to describe the concept that's being used here. And I'll explain more. So, or do you think lightly of the wealth of his generosity and of his hesed and of his slow of anger, forbearing, and of his uh, patience, disregarding the fact that the kindness of God is to lead you to teshuva, repentance. So, you know, a lot of what you can get, can gather is right there in the context. If you tolerate someone's sin, what, how will that ever lead them to repentance? They're not really going to feel any kind of motivation to do anything different because you're tolerating them. You know people like that, right? Like they're, they're, you know, 60 years old, still living with their parents. 
and getting away with just rotten behavior. They like to go around telling everybody that they ta- they are taking care of their parents, but really their parents are taking care of them. How are they ever going to be brought into repentance when everybody goes along with the wonky narrative or never challenges what it is that they're saying or what it is that they're doing? God does not do that. We know that God does not do that. The other context is Ephesians 4.2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. All right, let's go look at that context in the OJB. With all anava, humility, of mind and meekness, with savlanut, long-suffering, showing forbearance to one another in ahava. There's that concept of forbearance again. So let's look at the, let's look at, we're looking at, uh, I, I want to just point out to you how we're discerning this. We're going and looking at how did God use this in a sentence. We're cross-referencing with the OJB because of those linguistical nuances that we want to be able to pick up on. I did go to Strong's initially, but unfortunately the problem with Strong's is that they'll take that word and they, you know, they're not always correct. Um, in terms of like the biblical usage, and I just found it to be sort of useless. But you will find forbearance, this concept of forbearance in Strong's. In this particular case, I just don't find it to be very useful. So looking at how God, how did God use it in a sentence? What are the other translations? Um, and I'm looking specifically at the OJB. And then I'm going to sit and I'm going to think about, which I've already done and pulled up those scriptures. I'm going to think about All right, so what else does God use in his word? What else has he taught me about what his heart is and what he requires of us and how he interacts with us and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I know that God punishes. I know he disciplines. I know that God is not just, you know, some flippity flopper that's like sitting by pretending like he doesn't see what we're doing. I know that he's long-suffering, but that doesn't mean he's tolerating what I'm doing. And I know that he sends prophets to warn, he sends circumstances, he sends afflictions, and he's warning us and letting us know. So let's look at this concept of forbearance. If you Google forbearance, it's going to go to kind of that, you know, the typical use of forbearance, which has to do with like a loan, right? So forbearance is a temporary agreement to delay or reduce payments on a loan or mortgage. It can help people who are struggling financially, such as those who have lost their job, experienced medical costs, or had a natural disaster damage their home. Forbearance does not erase or reduce the amount owed. Oh, okay. So in this concept of forbearance, there's this understanding that the bank is not just going to tolerate the fact that you're not paying, but that they're taking, the lender is taking into consideration your circumstances. And God is able to do that. Like he's able to look at you and say, I know the situations I've given them in their life in order to build them. I know what the, I know the capacities that I've given them. I know the limitations that I have presented. He knows every single thing about your particular situation And so in his compassion, he is giving you discipline or judgment according to what he knows about your situation. So he's adjusting his response to you. I've told this story several times on the channel, but when I first started reading the word, I came across that story about uh, Lot's daughters sleeping with their father, getting him drunk and sleeping with him. That story bothered me very, very much really bothered me. And I still had this worldly, you know, worldly ideas that I could, um, you know, sort of have like my judgment towards God. And I turned up and judged him, you know, my judgment about his word, which ultimately is towards him. And I turned up in judgment and said, how could you let this happen? And he rebuked me immediately. And he rebuked me sharply. And he said to me, you don't get to judge me. And I I immediately felt that rebuke and I lowered myself and I repented. And in his kindness and mercy and compassion, he did speak with me about it. And he said, 
would you like me to judge you based on my righteousness? Would you like me to judge you based on the times you're living in and the deception that you were born into? Or shall I judge you by some other standard? I'll never forget that. I will never forget the way that he spoke with me and the wisdom and understanding that he was giving me in that moment. Because that is the way that God judges. He is the only one who's able to judge that way and determine what is appropriate in a given situation. But make no mistake, God does not tolerate sin. He does not tolerate bad behavior. And if he did, what he would be doing is disabling us. I have a neighbor who is 60 years old, lives with his father who is going to die in the next couple months. He doesn't know where he's going to live or what he's going to do because he hasn't had any requirement to be a big boy like ever in his life. I confronted him about getting into his car with a bottle of Jack Daniels and his response to me was, there's so much going on over here, I'm self-medicating. And you know me, it, you probably know me by now on the channel. I don't, I, I don't put up with that. I mean, I don't condone that or co-sign that and say, oh gosh, yeah, you know, we all need, need to self-medicate. That's the way to go. Let's self-medicate. So has that father done any good to his grown child? Now that he's at the end of his life and his grown child does not know where he's going to go, what he's going to do, he has no plan for his life because his father tolerated his sin. He never held him accountable. And I hear when I speak with the rest of the family, no one holds anybody accountable. So what happens in the end? And, and this is the thing is that God is not nearsighted. He sees the full picture and he is doing something and his goal is that we're going to be saved. We can't be saved through that kind of enabling, disabling, and co-signing. So if he's not doing something, if he's not saying something in the many ways he speaks in our dreams, our circumstances, our feelings and memories, our, you know, past traumas that he's been using in order to get our attention and build us. If he doesn't do these things in order to mold us and teach us and discipline us, how are we going to be prepared for the future and what is required in our covenant? Next year, the Antichrist is going to rise. If you're not prepared and you have some version of God inside of you that has been tolerating your sin and you use statements like, God knows my heart. Oh, he knows my heart in order to justify away your sin. And that's, that's your delusion of God. And I, I am using that very intentionally because that's not the God that he describes in the Bible. And there's no way that you have a relationship with God if that's what you think he is. How will you be prepared? How are you going to be ready for next year? Because you have work that you're supposed to be doing right now. Developmentally, a 60-year-old had work that they were supposed to be doing as a child to develop appropriately according to their age. And then as a young adult, and then or an adolescent, and then a young adult, and then throughout adulthood, as you launch into the world, there's supposed to be development that's occurring. You make dumb mistakes, you overspend, and then you're like, whoop, okay, now I'm going to learn how to budget because I don't want to live through that again. But if you never went through any of that, if no one's ever held you accountable, if everyone's been tolerating your sin or your immaturity, then you become a 60-year-old who is really going to start regressing and unraveling. All right, so we've looked at these different contexts. We have cross-referenced the translation. We have looked at the context of forbearance and that forbearance is really looking at a person's situation and seeing, okay, so what can you do? Like, you're going to have to get to this point, but what are you able to do right now? And what 
consequences need to happen in order for you to be able to be built. That's the relationship I have with God. That's the relationship I see that God has established between him and his people in the Bible. So now we're going to take a look at a couple of passages of scripture in order to support what it is that we know of God. When Jesus was teaching the apostles how to go out and share the message, he told them to go to each home and he said, if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. Did he tell them to tolerate? If they're not deserving, just, you know, hang out until they're ready. No. He said, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Not only is he telling you what you must do, that you need to dust your feet from those people and situations, but he is letting you know that he is going to deal with them on the day of judgment. Did Jesus do likewise, or is this just an instruction for us? Absolutely, Jesus did likewise. He discerned based on the fruit. Can they hear my message? And in the book of John, even when people could not hear his message and they were really fighting against him and they were saying, oh, well, we're, we're you know, Abraham's children. You know, that's always the thing that they were using, just like counterfeit Christianity always uses. Oh, Jesus paid it all. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do what Abraham did. You're not Abraham's children. You're children of the devil. You're children of your father, the devil, and your desire is to do what he wants to do. So Jesus discerned, and then he dusted his feet. He didn't keep going. He didn't chase down the pagans to try to make them understand. And even when he was rebuking the Pharisees, it wasn't even necessarily for their benefit. He wasn't the majority of the time, if not all the time, because I don't think he ever... I, you Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember a single time when he said to the Pharisees to repent. I mean, the implications there, they should know that they should repent. They're, they're the teachers of the law, aren't they? But he, just, he was constantly rebuking them. And it seems to be more so for our benefit than for theirs because they were so stiff-necked they weren't going to repent. They were looking for a way to kill him. In Psalm 101, verse 4, it says, The perverse heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. So it doesn't say I will tolerate what is evil. I will have nothing to do with it. Ephesians 5.11, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Okay, doesn't say tolerate. 1 Timothy 4.7, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly doesn't say tolerate it, doesn't say, well, then, you know, bring this into your education system. It doesn't say, uh, you know, sit around and have conversations, meaningless conversations with people who believe ridiculous things and don't believe in the God of gods. They believe in Greek mythology or whatever it is, uh, false doctrines, even in counterfeit Christianity. Doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. So even those who are calling themselves Christian and they have other ideas, you confront them and then you test their spirit to see if they actually love God. Because I'm going to tell you that there are, are the majority of people calling themselves Christian do not love God. They don't love God because when they're confronted about the things that they believe in, they're shown in the word, they do not turn. They do not accept it. They do not believe it. And they will not be, they will not change. So the word says, test the spirit. The word says, dust your feet. The word says that not everyone claiming to be from God is from him. And it's your job to figure that out and then separate yourself, consecrate yourself to him, not to the world and not to your desires to be liked, not to your desires to be a part of, not any of that, because all of that is worldly. All of that is of the flesh. 2 Timothy 3, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people, nothing, no tolerance, Nothing to do with such people. Titus 3.10, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time after that, have nothing to do with them. Okay, so you get the picture? 
this is what God has taught us. That is based on his heart. It's based on his example. And this is how we need to live. I hope this has helped you to understand the difference between being long suffering, being forbearing, being patient. There is nothing about tolerance in that concept. And forbearance really does have to do with looking at a person's situation and providing a way for them based on their circumstances, based on their capacities. That is something that we should be considering as we deal with one another. But the entire word needs to be taken together. If someone rejects God, you dust your feet. So the only people you're really interacting with are other believers. And even in dusting your feet, you can still have compassion for that person. You can still have under, you know, a certain level of understanding. You don't have necessarily the understanding that God has about their situation. You can still have that level of compassion. There's someone in my life who I love very much, but they don't believe. So I've had to dust my feet while continuing to pray for their salvation, while continuing to pray that they come to understanding. We don't know if any of these people are going to come to understanding. But that doesn't mean that we hang around. All of scripture has to be taken together. Please discern this message with God.